شهد النجوى تبارك وتعالى ثم الصلاة والسلام والتحية والإكرام على خاتم النبيين وسيد المرسلين وشفيع المذنبين الرسول المؤيد والنبي الممجد المصطفى الأمجد أبي القاسم محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين لا سيما عن الإمام المنتظر وحجة الله الثاني عشر ابن العسكري المنتظر ولعنة الله على أعدائهم أجمعين من الآن إلى قيام يوم الدين أما بعد Brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. First of all, I would like to offer my sincere condolences and tasliyat to all of you on the hulul and the arrival of the sad and hazin month of Muharram. A month may be sad and hazin and sorrowful for us but a month much, much more sad and sorrowful for the Ahlul Bayt. Because there have been several traditions which indicate that after the tragedy of Karbala, every single Mahasum and Imam that followed would impatiently be waiting for the month of Muharram to come so that they could shed their tears on their grandfather or their father, Imam Hussain, alayhi salam. <laughs> and we are, as the followers of the Ahlul Bayt, have a responsibility towards this month of Muharram in trying as much as is possible to fulfill the haqq of the Ahlul Bayt that they have upon us by means of this month of Muharram. We have to understand we will never be able to fulfill the actual haqq and the rights of the Ahlul Bayt. We can only make an effort. The time for the month of Muharram has arrived. <coughs> and one of the legacies that the month of Muharram has left behind and we can discuss at length. One of them is this institution of the Majalis. That because of the tragedy of Karbala, the institution that was established by the holy sister of the holy Imam, Hazrat Zainab al Kubra, the institution that she has set up by means of these Majalis is of such a profound nature that that even in a country like the United States or regions like the West where time is of constraint and so precious 
there are still opportunities like these where people take time off to sit together for the sake of Hussain. And this institution that she has established is, yes, it has its rewards. It has the thawab. But this institution works and has been established primarily for one purpose. And that is for educating people about Islam. To inform them what their religion talks about. To inform them what happens in Karbala, what has happened in Karbala. To inform them the sacrifices for which Hussein and on the ideologies for which Hussein made the sacrifice. And in continuation of the Sunnah and the Sunni of this, we will embark on the series of lectures starting from tonight. However, before we start, a few icebreakers that we need to embark upon before we can enter into the main lecture and the series. Is that from the first night onwards till the night of the 12th, we shall be discussing a certain topic. And these 12 nights, in addition to the 12, 10 nights of the Ashra Zainabiya and a few nights of Muharram, give us an opportunity to discuss at length one particular subject. Because normal days you just have one lecture and the speaker needs to summarize everything in 40, 45 minutes. But here there's a protracted period of time where things can be opened out and, and dwelt upon in detail. And this is what we shall be doing. However, as is a good practice always, and I do respect it, before coming, I had asked the, the office bearers of the Jamaat as to um, what has passed by in the previous Muharram so that I have an idea as to what to present so that I don't repeat what you've already heard last year. And the reply that came back was, was pretty surprising. I was, still, I was told, Sheikh, we would like you to, to repeat your two ashras that you had recited in the last two years. Now, the first ashra that of these two was recited in, in Dar es Salaam. And the second ashra was recited last year in Stanmore. It is a series of lectures that have started with the idea of life after death. And uh, it had initially originated in Mombasa, but unfortunately those lectures don't seem to be available. Despite repeated requests by people, I have not been able to procure them. But the Ashra in Dar es Salaam talked about events taking place after a person has died, 12 lectures, a person dies and what happens into the grave. And the Ashra in Stanmore last year talked about what happens after a person's barzakh has finished and he goes on to the Day of Judgment. I can assure you it was pretty cold last year in, in, in Muharram in Stanmore. But the heat of the lectures was, was overcoming the coolness and the chill of the weather. If that was the case there, and if I'm asked to, 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 to combine both lectures, Orlando might get a little too hot. Uh, so as usual, as I've been always having this practice, viewer discretion is advised because things might get a little graphic at times. That is one. Point number two, it might appear a very simple thing that pick up your lectures of last two years and speak it out. Except for two problems. The first problem, both these lectures talk about two particular phases in life after death. One is from the time a person sees death till the time he's put into the grave. And then afterwards, what happens into the grave and then on to the Day of Judgment. Both of these encompass 24 lectures. To summarize them into 12 is very difficult. One. Secondly, alhamdulillah, in both these regions that I have visited in these last two years, I have been graced with enormous support by the community to an extent that I would extend the lectures to one hour, 30 minutes, and there was no outcry. I don't know how much supportive the Orlando Jamaat would be. I'm, I will not take my chances in the first two, three nights because 
I don't want the entire Jumaat to go away and just the office bearers to be sitting. They have to sit anyway. They've invited me. So basically, it's the length of the lectures and the time duration. If I have to summarize, then it is going to be a tough task. Normally, whenever I go for the lectures, I know exactly how to phase it out. And I know what would come in what lecture. This time, I'm not sure. So I will be just taking the lectures day one, day two, and see how we can take it apart. The, the skeleton is there. Only I will not be able to tell you what will come when because of the, this, this entire uh, logistical problems that is before me. But having read that request, I felt it was a good idea. Because if somebody wants to have a snapshot of what exactly happens from the time a person dies till the time a person lands up on the Day of Judgment before his God, this would be an ideal platform that you summarize the entire event and I would have to make changes, definitely. I would definitely not be repeating what, uh, everything what was said. I have identified one specific topic that I would definitely want to emphasize, which I have not end, uh, embarked upon before. So inshallah, we'll try to make this uh, hot and steamy uh, to cover up the, the, the coolness of Orlando. Before I start, salam. Allah. The purpose of these lectures that, that we shall be hearing and discussing over here, fun, one thing we have to be very clever is that no, uh, clear is that nobody wants to, to scare anybody. Nobody wants to frighten anybody. Nobody wants to, to make somebody uh, fear out of, uh, shiver out of fear. But it is something that has always been emphasized by the Quran, by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to his prophets. So you find that although the Prophet has been sent as Rahmatun lil Alameen, Quran says that we have sent the Prophet as a, as a mercy for mankind. The same Prophet has been referred to the Quran in the Quran by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Surah Ra'd, verse number 7, wherein he says this, you may be the mercy for the mankind, and I have sent you as a mercy for mankind, and for whomever you shall seek forgiveness, I am there to forgive, and for whomsoever you shall seek shifa'at, I am there to do shifa'at. However, one very important position, my beloved Muhammad, that you should realize is, innama anta mundir, that you are but a warner. We have sent you as a warner to warn the people that yes, there is paradise. To warn the people that yes, there are Hur and Hurul Ain, but also to warn them there is something which is called hell, and there is something which is called the fire of hell, and there is something which is the Ghadab of God, and this is there is something which is called the anger of God. God is not just a Rahman and a Rahim, He is Jabbar and He is Qahar as well. So, innama anta mundir, you may be the Rahmat al Alameen, but we have sent you also as a Warner and the warner's job and responsibility is to warn how the other person takes it, it is upon them. The warner's job is to provide the information of what is going to happen, information about what the listener might not be very ready to listen to. But the facts are there, the reality is there. Somebody accepts or not accepts, that's her, his or her problem. If I were to go out onto the road in the middle of the day and have to close my eyes and say there is no sun, I would only be deceiving myself. The sun is there. The reality is there. It is shining. That is the truth. I close my eyes to the truth. It's me who is deceiving myself, not the sun. What is going to happen is going to happen. If I want to blindfold myself, that yes, we will see it when it comes. Higher than that's how it should be then. And so we should start off with this thing in mind. But the important thing over here is that before we go, there are certain prerequisites that are very important to be understood and to be realized and to be known. Something that we might be aware of, but we have not been concentrating and focused upon it to know the importance of that aspect. And that aspect is this entity called man. It's an amazing creation of God, whereby he is gathered together two dimensions which are diametrically opposite to each other combine them to form one form each for each dimension working according to its own rulings but living symmetrically in a world that is totally alien to them or alien to at least one of them means what 
means that this body of man that we are looking and which will be the one that will be suffering or witnessing or experiencing the ecstasy and pleasure whether it is after death or in the day of judgment or in the barzak or wherever is something that is composed of two dimensions one is this physical dimension the bones the flesh the blood and the other is the spiritual dimension the soul something which is referred to twice in the quran and i quote from surah to saad when allah says when he's referring to that incident and he wants to communicate with us the incident about Hadrat Adam alayhi salam. And then he says, وَإِذْ قَالَ Remember that time. وَإِذْ قَالَ رَبُّكَ لِلْمَلَائِكَةِ إِنِّي خَالِقٌ بَشَرًا مِّنْ طِينٍ فَإِذَا سَوَّيْتُهُ وَنَفَخْتُ فِيهِ مِنْ رُوحِي فَقَعُوا لَهُ سَاجِدِينَ In this verse he mentions very shortly, but he very clearly mentions the two dimensions of man. He says, remember the time, I want to tell you the story of Adam, I want to tell you the story of Iblis. What happened that Iblis became shaitan? He's saying, إِذْ قَالَ رَبُّكَ لِلْمَلَائِكَةِ At that time Allah turned to the angels and said, إِنِّي خَالَقٌ بَشَرًا مِّنْ طِينَ I am going to create man from earth, from clay, from soil. Then he says, فَإِذَا خَسَوَّيْتُهُ When I've given the, bo the, the, the body a form, the head, the torso, the legs, وَنَّفَخْتُ فِي حِمِ الرُّوحِي And when I have blown into him the soul from me فَقَعُوا لَهُ سَاجَدِينَ Bow down and prostration before this creation of man. Two distinct phases. فَإِذَا سَوَّيْتُهُ When I have formed him. This formation is the physical dimension of man. When I have given him the eyes, when I have given him the head, when I have given him the hands, when I have given him the legs, when I have formed him, when I have blown into him the soul from me, the spiritual dimension. Both these two dimensions, one related to the material world, the dunya, where everything is matter, material. And one thing related to the spiritual world where everything is spiritual, non-corporeal, non-physical, you cannot see, you cannot hear unless made to hear, you cannot touch, you cannot sense. Two extremely diametrically dimensions of creation of God. Two entities picked up from these creations, molded together into something that is called man. And it is for this reason that in Surah Al-Mu'minun, verse number 24, when he's talking about the creation of man, and that long-winded discussion, when he says the formation of man, that he's made him from alaqa, thumma khalaqa al-alaqa, then from the alaqa al-mudga, from mudga al-idam, fakasawna al-idam al when he details out the physical formation of man, in, of the embryo in the womb of the mother, at that time when he says that now I have created a new man. New man means what? This physical creature, the physical dimension mixed with the spiritual dimension. It is an act of amazement that God now at this time commends and praises himself and says, He has done such an amazing act of creation, of getting two different entities from two different realms, from two different characteristics, molded into one to give an entity, man. Then he says, Allahu ahsanul khaliqin. And hallowed be that God, the best of the creator. This amalgamation of two entities is man. And when... This man is there. Both of these entities have their own feelings and characteristics. At times they may be together, at times they separate out. So at times you might find that this body feels ease and comfort. This body feels trouble and distress. At the same time, that soul that is within us, which is running this body, also has its phases of ease and comfort and phases of distress and discomfiture. So you find you may be sitting in an air-conditioned room. Your body is completely at ease. But your son who was supposed to come on Saturday night at 12.11.30, it's 1 o'clock, he has not come, your mind is disturbed. The body is at ease, but the mind is disturbed. At the same time, diametrically opposite, in the month of Ramadan, the body is craving for food. But the son gets a beautiful results from the school and you're elated. The body wants food. 
the throat is dry but the mind is happy so each of it has its own sense of behavior but it is here that when death comes the act of dying when it happens it separates these two dimensions back to their original states so the physical dimension is now separated from the spiritual dimension what had once amalgamated together a time comes when it is now separated this is what an islamic concept is, is referred to as wa kullu shay'in yarji'u ila asli everything returns back to its original state this body's original state is earth it will go back to earth and become earth everything has to return back to its original state when death comes what it does is it separates this amalgamation the soul is separated the body is separated once this happens both of them have their own individual rulings applicable to them each of them has have has its own rulings so when it comes to the body now this person is dead and we just breaking ice we are not going into the the real stuff now when this amalgamation is separated each of these entities have their own rulings and laws so when you come to the physical body you have the rulings you have to it has to be given ghosl it has to be given kafan it has to be given dafan there is no soul it is just plain body dead lifeless but there are rulings for it similarly that soul has its own rulings subjection to the punishment of the grave the questioning in the grave and the likes that will come slowly so both these dimensions separated but are subjected to their own rulings have their own laws which has been formulated by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but now when this comes about and death takes place and they have their own rulings let us understand however much we may try to understand and comprehend death as we sit in this world whatever part of the world however advanced we will never be able to comprehend it it's like a child in the womb of the mother you say you talk to the child say you know kukupaka quite a lot from dar salam right in zanzibar so i cannot kai shakun chu barabar che na see it's so tasty it's so beautiful mandazi so beautiful if the child was able to hear and it hears and if he was able to understand all that would go into his ears would be the words this is so beautiful this is so delicious this is so tasty what it exactly means he doesn't know he will only know when he comes steps into zanzibar and eats it that is the only time he will know it similarly here we may discuss whatever we may want to about events that are going to take place after that till we do not experience them we will never know the exact nature of it but the masumin alaihi salam have endeavored to give some sort of explanation to this finite brain and intellect of man on which he has so much pride and ghurur so you find several similarities and similes that are given by the masumin just to make people understand you will not understand everything but we are trying to make sure at least you have an inkling of an understanding of what is going to come so at times when he, when, when an imam is asked oh, what is death he doesn't say what is death like for example in on the on the day of ashura when he's giving the khutbah to his his companions he himself comes out impromptu spontaneous he's saying don't fear tomorrow huh? tomorrow you and me are going to die you don't have to fear that not you at least these 72 people you don't have to fear that fam al maut illa qantaratun ta'aburu bikum min al bu'us wa al dara ila al jinan al wasa'a when naim al daima you see you don't have to fear death you know what death is for you death is just a, a bridge that will take you from the miseries and the calamities and the disturbances and the troubles of this world where ila al jinan al wasa wide spread gardens of bliss when naim al daima and everlasting infinite bounties and the grace of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but at times you find that to make it more realistic to normal people like you and me you find our fifth imam muhammad ibn ali al baqir alayhi salatu was salam oh. 
somebody asks him ibn rasulullah what is death can, can you explain to me he saying what do i tell you you will not be able to understand please give me some explanation he saying huwa an-nawm alladhi ya'tikum kull laylah illa annahu tabil al-muddatu he saying this death that you are asking I, i don't know how to explain to you because and and i understand think cap- capable i say you might compare that comes to every night one of masoom sleep only that sleep a certain period of time and the the to sleep keep that as him la yat bi hum illa yawm the sleep comes up ex upon the day of judgment into the sleep and this is how it is huh? in death what happens in death soul comes out of the body the physical dimension gets separated from the spiritual dimension the soul comes out of the body that is death this is exactly what happens every night and afternoon that you and me sleep huh? when you and me sleep that sleep doesn't mean that our body and our soul goes to rest it means that the body goes to rest the soul comes out of the body surah number 39 verse number 42 quran is saying this huh? this is not science quran is saying this science you can put a question mark Quran you cannot put a question mark Allah yatawaffa al-anfus hayna mawtaha wallati lam tamut fi manamiha fa yursilu allati qada alayha al-mawt fa yumsiku allati qada alayha al-mawt wa yursilu al-ukhra ila ajalin musamma Allah says when you go to sleep and when you die similar actions i do Allah is that entity surah 39 verse 42 Allah is that entity that takes the soul of every individual whether he is dying or whether he is sleeping but that person who is dying for yumsiku allati qada alayha almaut those souls on whom the prescription of god has fallen that the soul needs to die yumsiki holds it back and does not allow it to come back to the body وَيُرْسِلُ الْأُخْرَى إِلَىٰ أَجَلٍ مُسَمَّى Whereas those souls whose death have not, has not been prescribed, يُرْسِلُ He sends them back into the body up to when? إِلَىٰ أَجَلٍ مُسَمَّى Till a prescribed time when the soul also will be preserved and, and held back and not sent to the body. Comparison of sleep and death by Imam Baqir a.s. explained more in the Qur'an. That means when you and me die our souls go but when you and me sleep our souls go only thing you can the, the difference is the time limit whereby the soul returns back to the body when a person dies the soul does not come to the back to the body till the day of judgment or till the akhirah whereas in the sleep a person's soul is returned back till the time death has been ordained for him So in other words sleep is a lesser death and death is a greater sleep death is a greater sleep but when you come to this point a question may come a shaykh you are talking that a person's soul comes out of the body when he's dead a person's soul comes out of the body when he's sleeping who oh, but sleep is different than death is different because when a person is die is dead and a fly sits on the bo- on the nose he doesn't move whereas a person is sleeping and a fly sits on the nose he begins to move but you said the soul comes out you bring in the verses of the quran how does it work it works this way friends at the time of death and at the time of sleep yes the soul does come out of the body but the manner in which the soul is made to sever its links with the body differs 
at the time of death every sort of relationship between the soul and the body is kabisa severed to its absolute limits that means no interaction remains no links remain between the soul and the body but at the time of sleep the body the soul that is taken out the severance is not so in- intense links still remain with the body as a result of which although the soul is outside the body the body still is living till that complete severance takes place then the sleep will become death till that complete severance doesn't take place the effects and the impact and the influence of that soul that has come out of the body still tends to affect the body it's like the sun bana sun is there it's not right here right but its rays do affect us its rays do provide heat its rays do provide photosynthesis mechanisms to the plants it's not over here but the rays are there that link is there that link remains between the soul and the body at the time of sleep but that link is kabis is separated when the person is dead so when the person is dead there's no influence of the soul on the body that body is kabis a lifeless at the time of death this doesn't take place and hence it has been so emphatically imprinted in the books of a hadith that when death is compared to sleep by the fifth imam you get a very different perspective of sleep with imam ali alayhi salam it's a case of a glass half full and half empty the fifth imam has explained and compared sleep to death in one perspective but ajiba the first imam is comparing the same sleep to life in another perspective He says this life that you are leading right now is eventually going to end because in numerous verses in the Quran directly or indirectly it has been mentioned that everyone is going to die at times he says wa kullu nafsin daiqatul maut three times in the Quran at times he will say wa kullu man alayha fan everything that is there is going to die straight direct no beating around the bush at times it's implicit indirect wa ilayna tuhsharun and to us is your return inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un and to whom you shall return he's not talking that everyone will die but he's saying all of us will return what does it mean it means you're going to die you're not going to get the klm flight to klm is moving in my mind because of the delay that to suffer <laughs> so you find that these sort of things need to be understood now when you move and understand the concept imam ali is saying remember your life is going to end what is important is not what is whether it is going to end or not the important thing is how is it going to end and then he says anasun niyamun in this world all of the people are sleeping it is only when death comes they will stay remain awake and get up they will get up from the slumber right now in this world everybody is caught up with this world to such an extent that they forget death it is only when death comes to them and they die that they will get up and they will realize that life that they were living in this world was a dream now they have woken up and that's why immense intense innumerable representations in the books of ahadith from the masumin keep death in mind don't forget death the moment you forget death you're playing with your akhara remember this death is going to come this body is going to remain all these pleasures of the body are going to remain in this world you're going to another place at that time you will regret now you are in a dream world You want a house, you want a swimming pool, you want a five cars, you want this, you want that. Dream ah. Huh? The real life will begin. You will and I will get up. When I see you I'm talking about myself as well. We will get up when malakul maut comes. When it's a time for sleeping will be the actual time when we get up. At that time there will be no return. We will come to it. And so we find that there have been innumerable innumerable representations in the in the ahadith. that remember death aktheru dhikr al maut aktheru dhikr al maut aktheru dhikr al maut increase your understanding and remembrance of maut because that is what can save you and me 
and how it can save you and how it can lead us this this world this material world listen slowly before we we end tonight i have to give you a little dose right tradition says at the time of death when a person is about to die and he's seeing malakul maut all those descriptions will come but i'll beat it at, at a very fast pace we have to cover comprehensively horizontally rather than vertically all the other lectures were vertical this time we have to go horizontal tradition says when a person is about to die and he realizes he's messed up when he sees this, he you know he's looking for help he's looking for somebody to help him he's all alone he's about to die and he's seeing things that he's never seen before that itself is a major shock to him all the things he's heard and imagined is nothing compared to what he's witnessing now and this is what will be the state huh? we will talk about all this in the future lectures so he looks around who can help me he finds three entities standing behind besides him he turns to the first he says who are you he's saying i'm your wealth and your property and the riches that you collected in this world he's happy because he sees a huge number huge stout person turns to the other one and says who are you he's saying i'm your son i'm your daughter i'm your wife i'm your relatives He turns to the third one. Who are you? Thin, weak. I'm your good deeds. Turns to the wealth and riches because that's what he spent most of his time. He's saying I'm in a bad state now, and I'm seeing myself messed up, and I see things that I've not seen before, and I know where I'm leading to. Can you help me? Saying yes, we can help you. He's happy. Oh, somebody is there to help me. Saying how much can you help me take me out from this mess? So we cannot take you out from the mess. We can help you. So what do you mean? So we can give you something. What can you give me to help me out? He's saying from us we can give you enough to buy one piece of kafan. That's the only thing we can give you. Not more than this. Saying what are you talking about? Whole of my sixty years of my life I have spent for you. Collecting you, saving you, honoring you, giving you dignity, sacrificing things that God did not want me to do, sacrificing things that disobeying God for things that He wanted me to do to collect you. Now you're giving me enough for one piece of kafan. He's saying that's where our limits end. You wanted to take it. He turns to his relatives, my son. How much did I not spend to send you to the University of California? This is Orlando. You got University of Orlando. How much did I not spend in sending you to the University of Orlando? I borrowed, I begged, I stole, hook, crook. I got enough money. I made you this. I made you that. My daughter, did I not find such a beautiful, handsome guy for you without a beard? Everybody would look at him and say, "I wish he was my son-in-law." Were you not proud to move around with him when he was holding that goblet of wine and beer? How can you help me out? I say, parents, my my father, my hubby, my spouse, I'm there to help you. There to help you. Ah, now I got good number. How much can you help me? Don't worry, father. We are there. You are alone. We will pick you up. We are. You are alone. We will carry you. You are alone. We will take you to the graveyard. You are alone. We will put you into the grave. You are alone. We will put mud over you. He's saying, after that is where I need your help. He's saying, sorry, this is where our limits end. What do you mean where the limits end? You were the ones before whom I flouted the rulings of God that I've got myself into this mess. You were the ones who had to go to Switzerland and I had to take interest on my capital so that I could send you to Switzerland. You were the one, my son, for whom I had to do so many haram things so that I could get you into a good university. And you, my daughter, I wanted to keep you without hijab so that you could mix with the people. Peer pressure. This is what you can do. Saying the maximum limit that we can do is put mud onto your face when you're onto the grave. Wow, Wayla! It is this at the time Imam says, "Anna sunniyamun fa ida ma tuntbahu." People are sleeping. It's only when they die that they wake up. <coughs> this is the time. Two of the three left out. No help. He turns to the third. Before he says anything, the third says, "Don't worry, I am with you." When the coffin person gives you the coffin and goes, I will be there. When your relatives leave you onto the earth and go, I will be there. 
I will sit beside you in the grave. I will be there with you when the malakul ma- when mamun karan nakir come. I will be there with you when you are raised up on the day of judgment. I will be there with you when you are talking to God. I will be there with you when the punishment or the prosperity is passed on upon you. I will be there with you. He is the last person that this person wants. He says, "I do not want you." Because you are my major problem. I have never cared for you. Because he is the good deeds of man. Thin, weak, without any support. What will you help me? You like it or not, I am going to stay with you. And I am going to tell everybody what you have done. For me, there is no escape from you. And for you, there is no escape from me. We are together as brothers. He is saying, go away. He says, no, it doesn't work. Quran says, يَوْمَ تَجِدُ كُلُّ نَفْسٍ مَا عَمِلَتْ مِنْ خَيْرٍ مُحْضَرًا وَمَا عَمِلَتْ مِنْ سُوءٍ يَوَدْ لَوْ أَنَّهُ أَنَّهَا بَيْنَهُ وَبَيْنَهَا Amadam Baida. A day will come when man will see all his deeds, good deeds and bad deeds in front of him. And when he sees his bad deeds, Yawaddu anna law baynahum wa baynaha. Amadam Baida. He will wish that between him and his bad deeds, there was a huge major distance. It doesn't work. This thin, lean and weak Amal will stay with him, although he might say, go away. Because that represents all the sins and the disobediences this man has done in the world. He doesn't want to see him. But that will not go away from him. This is what he says. Anasun niyamun. People are sleeping. Fa'idha matun tabahu. When they die, it is then that they will wake up. It is then that they will realize where things have gone. And this is just a small start-up. To what eventually will unfold with respect to man. We either accept it and be submissive to the truth. Or we choose to ignore it at our own peril. But this aspect about death, everybody fears. Why the fear will come tomorrow? How the fear will come tomorrow? But everybody fears death. I would not fear somebody were to tell me that while well, you're going to Orlando for this Muharram. There's nothing to fear because I know who I'm talking to. I know the people I'm looking at. I know that place. Somebody were to tell me, oh, take a ticket, you're going to Chungani, Kabristan. Everybody would get scared, right? Yes. And we've got a right to be scared. Why? Tomorrow. <coughs> but you are not scared on this. There are certain individuals who don't get scared. <coughs> certain individuals are not worried about death. Because of the fact that whatever they needed to do to make death a pleasurable one, they've already done it. All along that route from, from, Medina, from Medina to Makkah and Makkah to Kufa, the families of the, whole, uh, of the Ahlul Bayt constantly repeating Istirja. Istirja means inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raja'un. So many times, in numerable locations, Imam Hussain sitting and says, inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raja'un. Constantly reminding himself of death. He doesn't need to remind himself of death. He knows what is his rank and position. Constantly reminding still. Despite that, he's constantly reminding. Because he doesn't fear death. But, it all started from this point onwards. First of <coughs> Haram that we are listening to it. And this is attributed to that first incident that sparked off this entire event of Karbala. Hussein is called by the governor of Yazid to the court in Medina. <coughs> Hussein goes. The governor says, I have received a message from the Khalifatul Muslimin Yazid. So Imam says, what is that message? <coughs> the governor says, I have received orders that he has declared himself as the Khalifa of the Muslimin, the leader of the Muslims, and he wants the bayat of all the people. So Hussain says, what does that got to do with me? He's saying, he has specifically asked me to take your bayat. It's either your hand on his hand or your head on his hand 
what would you prefer? Imam says, I need to think. See, there have been occasions when occasions where, where opportunities of shahadat would come before the imams. Don't think that it was only the first time that Ibn Muljam hit Imam Ali salam and he was on the verge of death. Don't think that Imam Radha, the f- that was the first time that he was offered poison that he ate and consumed and he passed away. I don't think the same thing happened with the third, the second Imam, Imam Hussain, that the very first time he was, he was poisoned, he was killed. No, <clears throat> there have been opportunities where they could have been killed and they could have been martyred. They have chosen to refuse. Martyrdom is good. It's excellent. But that martyrdom which benefits Islam, getting killed by means of which Islam does not benefit, that is not shahadat, that is foolishness. And these were these occasions that the Masumin avoided. You remember when Imam Hussain salam converted his, umrah into, his hajj into Umrah and left, he had come to know that the assassins of Yazid had come under the garb of hajis into Makkah. Imam Hussain moves from Medina to Makkah. Makkah, he stays there up to the 9th of the Hijjah where he comes, he wants to do his last hajj. At that time he receives information, assassins and mercenaries of Yazid have come in the, in the guise of hajis and have infiltrated the crowd and they would kill him. He knew that if he was killed over there, it would not make an impact as much as it would had he been, if he was killed in Karbala. So he turns his hajj into Umrah and goes away. Not that he is scared of shahada. Not that he is scared of dying. Not that he doesn't want to die. But he wants to die for the cause of Islam, for the benefit of Islam. Several occasions before Imam Radha was given poison, he refused to eat it. Why did he eat it now? Because he knew now the time was right that his death, which was supposed to be at the hands of Mamun, at this time would create maximum benefits to Islam. So he took it. Imam Hassan and traditions report, die when Joseph gave maximum Islam that's that be Imam Hussein he wants my hand on my head he goes I cannot my head now if I give my head now it's not beneficial of the governor of it will not benefit go outside he makes have to leave Medina. He comes to say, there's no longer you have to leave. What happened? Is it wants a bayah? You know, me, me, the likes of the Lord to bayah to likes of your We have Medina. Preparations have to leave quickly. The where are you? You, what are you? I'm the graveyard of the Holy Bit. I give my father of the Holy Bit. Tradition says he goes to the of the Prophet, begins to cry, and he cries and he cries and cries. So my ayat, because of that intense weeping, he's overcome by sleep. And he sees the Prophet. Out of the as the grand sees the grand person to do is a yara so what your umma a term where Hussein is supposed to do by add to the someone like is it noble that we get back to you and you take me with you? Hussein to me that who would go to karma would pull up I have to go Hussein. Rank and you the eyes of God only be opens his does his half his of his brother ending mission says like for the ground he says, Can you be my would come to put 
grave and come into put as is a tradition the voice of the grave alayka salana ya anusa my son you will not and it is you will this is it of the ويا عالم من الذين من قلب 